Hi, I'm Tom Stone, the National Sales Manager of Industrial Markets for Thermal Care. Thermal Care has been in the process cooling business for over 50 years and serves over 50 different industries. So I bring these up because two of the key things to understand is, you know, sizing your chiller correctly so that you're not either under or oversized um, for the unit. And we mean that based on the actual capacity of the unit. So if it's a, a system that requires five tons of cooling, we want to make sure our chiller is capable of meeting that, but not by exceeding it by too great of an amount. And so we'll talk first about how you know if your chiller is undersized. And really what's happening there is the energy that it's, that's being input into the process water is coming in too quickly and the chiller can't reject it fast enough. So you get a buildup of that energy in there. So the temperature actually starts to rise. Um, what's nice sometimes though is with that gain of capacity as we were increasing that set point, that's really referring to what the chiller is actually producing. And so I could have it set at 50, but if I have a requirement for 10.5 tons, that temperature is actually going to rise up to about 54, as we saw from the earlier slides, where it gets over that 10.5 mark. It gets 10.65 tons. And so once you hit that, it's going to find an equilibrium there. But what you can tell from that is, is you have it set at 50, but it can only achieve 54. You then know that that chiller is slightly undersized. Um, the other thing is that, you know, a properly sized chiller should almost never run at 100%. You want it to be in that 75 to 85% uh, loading range uh, for, you know, your full system demand. And that gives you a little safety factor. It also allows the unit to operate at some of it more efficient point, so both for the compressor and the pump as well. Um, one of the only times that you'll see 100% uh, load on the unit is at the beginning of a startup. So you have a, a volume of water that has you know, equalized with the ambient condition, and then we need to start circulating that at a much lower temperature. We're going to use 100% of the chiller to pull that volume of water down to our desired set point, and then from there, as we start to actually um, impart heat into the system, it will uh, modulate that capacity and be below that 100%. Um, some of the things that you can check is first to check the insulation in your system. If you, if you find out or you think that your chiller might be undersized, you might be uh, inducing extra loads on the system. And so with insulation, you actually can get condensation. And when you condense water, What's actually happening there is you're pulling energy out of the ambient air and that moisture in the air, and you're pulling it into your system water. And so that's what actually causes that condensation. And so on the surfaces of the pipe, you're gonna get those water droplets, and that's actually a heat load on your system. You can avoid that by having them properly insulated. So it can save you uh, both operating issues, but also cost of operation, so save you money directly. Also, uh, there's a potential for scale buildup. And you'll see this a lot more with a, a cooling tower system where the water is uh, a lot more contaminated with dissolved solids, but it can happen with chiller systems depending on the quality of the water that you fill the system with. Uh, but what actually happens there, it's very similar to what's happening when we put that glycol in. It inhibits that heat transfer. You basically put like a layer of insulation inside the pipe. So now you've stopped that ability for it to absorb the heat where you want it to. And so, uh, with something like that, it's, you know, understanding what the quality of your water is, uh, having a, a water chemistry expert take a look at it. And then if you do consider that, it might be, you know, need to replace some piping, you need to replace uh, the heat exchanger, or there's uh, acid washes, acid flushes that can help with that as well. Next, we'll talk about an oversized chiller. So now we're going the other direction. So we had a five ton and we put a 25 ton chiller on there. So it's grossly oversized. And so what actually will start to happen is you need to look at different methods of capacity control, which we'll talk about a couple of those. And one of those to really kind of illustrate the pitfalls of this and why we developed other methods of capacity control is compressor cycling. And so what we'll have here is we have a graph and that blue line is going to depict our set point temperature, actually the temperature of the process water, not even the set point. Um, 
So on the, um, the y-axis, we have temperature, and on the x-axis, we have time. And so what will actually start to happen as this system operates when the chiller is oversized is we're going to overcool. And so that uh, horizontal solid gray line is our set point. And so when we're, we're pulling the system down at the beginning there, we achieve that set point. But because the chiller is now oversized, it actually cools too much and pulls the temperature below where we want it. And so there's logic within the controller of the chiller that says, okay, I've cooled too far. I need to shut off so I don't risk, uh, you know, going way outside of tolerance or potentially reaching a freezing scenario, something like that. So we'll actually shut the compressor off. And so that's where we hit that uh, valley right there in the middle. And so now the compressor is off. So we're no longer cooling, but we're still circulating water through the system and we're picking up heat from the process. So that heat will pick up and start to build up and rate the temperature. So we'll start to approach our set point. Once we hit that set point, that's where we would basically want to turn the compressor back on so we don't overshoot. But the problem with that is, is we have what's in the logic of the controller called an anti-cycle timer. And what this does is it actually protects the compressor from starting too many times over a period of time. And uh, um, the, the actual limit is 12 times per hour. So basically five minutes between start to start. And so if we build up that temperature in that uh, that process water before the compressor is allowed to turn back on, we will actually overshoot our set point. Uh, this actual waveform here of the, the temperature, the actual temperature of the system, I've heard to as porpoising because you're kind of going up and down and up and down and you're never actually hitting that set point and controlling to the desired point. Uh, so the main problem with compressor cycling is you get very poor temperature control but then you also reduce the life of that compressor because we do limit it to protect the compressor, but still that starting and stopping is not great for the life cycle of that compressor. So what do we do to combat that? We have different methods of capacity control. One of those methods is hot gas bypass or HGBP. And what that actually does is it essentially simulates a load on the chiller by diverting hot gas in the refrigerant circuit directly into the evaporator, and it essentially makes that compressor want to operate at its 100% point. And what that means is now we have essentially eliminated that ability to overcool, so we're not going to have to turn that compressor off. We're not going to have to wait for it to turn back on. So we've allowed ourselves a very nice, tight temperature control. The problem with this is, is it's a very inefficient means of capacity control. So what we've developed at Thermal Care is a, a variable speed uh, unit, our NQV series. And what this actually does is instead of the compressor being on or off at zero or 100%, we actually control the speed of the motor using a VFD to meet the demand of the system. So it will actually ramp the speed up and down to meet that demand. And so as you can see here on this graph, that red line depicts what the energy consumption of a unit using hot gas bypass is. It's basically almost at its full capacity of consumption throughout the full range of the loads that could be on it. That green line depicts a variable speed unit. So what it's actually doing is it's ramping that speed up and matching the demand of the system with the amount of energy that it consumes to do that. So that difference in area between those two curves is the energy savings. Uh, we've seen, you know, very strong paybacks with this uh, technology. Uh, another additional benefit is a, a variable speed compressor unit will allow you to be flexible in your application of it. So if you have multiple machines that don't all need to run at once and one is a smaller heat load and then one is a larger heat load, you could buy a single chiller to supply all of them because it will meet the demand of that larger uh, capacity requirement, but then in the instances where it needs to support that smaller one, it'll actually ramp down and meet that demand too, saving all of that energy that would have been wasted otherwise. Uh, it also allows you to plan ahead for your system. So you have one machine now and you're gonna build up to three or four total. You can use this at that beginning stage. And then as more machines are added, the chiller doesn't need to be changed, but it actually grows with the system to match it. So it gives you a lot of flexibility as well. I hope that helps you guys and thank you for your time.